This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. Our top stories this morning. Japanese stocks slip the most in months on growing speculation the Bank of Japan will raise rates. Investors look ahead to US inflation data tomorrow after Friday's mixed jobs report. As the holy month of Ramadan begins, ceasefire talks remain deadlocked. US President Joe Biden warns Israel that invading Rafa would be a red line. Plus, Aramco's $31 billion gift, the world's biggest oil exporter, ramps up its quarterly dividend despite lower oil prices, boosting revenues for the Saudi government. Well, it's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. And you are seeing a risk-off mood across equities as the downbeat mood from last week spills over into this week. If you look at the MSCI Asia Pacific Index, it's currently down 1.1%. We're set for a lower opening in the European session as well. Currently, Eurostoxx 50 futures lower six-tenths of a percent. We do await that UK jobs data at 7 a.m. London time, of course, crucial to the bank. Bank of England's timing on when it's going to cut rates. And as we look ahead to the US session, currently futures on the S&P lower a quarter of a percent. Nasdaq futures lower nearly four tenths of a percent. All eyes now on that US CPI reading tomorrow. If we flip over to the cross-asset picture, you can see that Treasury yields are holding pretty steady on the 10-year, currently at 4.06 percent. You've had a bit of strength on the yen off the back of that GDP data out of Japan, uh, showing that Japan did manage to avoid a technical recession. And we'll have more on that in a moment as we look ahead to the BOJ meeting next week. But Brent trades at $81 a barrel, uh, four tenths, uh, six tenths of a percent weaker as we await the OPEC report and the IEA report this week. And just a look to Bitcoin, $68,000 is where we trade, much lower than that 70 k mark that it managed to hit last week. But let's check in now on how Asia markets are faring, we can go to Averill Hong in Singapore. Averill, Japan managing to dodge a technical recession and actually you're seeing that hitting Japanese stocks this morning. Yeah, I think that is among the data that is adding to the case for the BOJ's exit from negative rate policy. And next week's meeting is only a very live one. As you say, that's putting pressure on Japanese equities, including the AI and chip-related ones, particularly hard hit, not just because of the strength of the yen, but also that downdraft that we got from US counterparts last week. Uh, we're seeing Chinese tech stocks, the consumer-related ones, a bright spot today after data that showed CPI rose after four months of declines. Uh, this seems to be a temporary short-lived thing though, so might not be reading too much into it. Let's flip the board and take a look at the cross-asset picture across Japan because the Nikkei is down as is the topics. We're seeing the topics declining by the most since October last year. Japanese bonds under pressure. We're also seeing the yen, as you mentioned earlier, sitting below the 147 level. This is the strongest against the greenback since the start of February on the back of that GDP data, but also what we're getting from media noise. A lot of chatter coming in, including the latest from GG Press, talking about how the BOJ is mulling not just the end of negative rate policy, but also yield control. So as I say, the meeting next week will be really one to watch, Lizzie. Definitely, Averill. Thank you for Averill Hong in Singapore. And now let's get back to that geopolitical story. Ramadan has begun, but ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas appear to be deadlocked. The US had hoped for a six-week pause in fighting and the release of dozens of Israeli hostages in return for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. Without a deal, Israel has threatened to invade Rafa, where more than a million Palestinians are sheltering. Joining me now for the latest is Bloomberg's Dana Kreish. Dana, do we have any sense of when or if Israel would invade Rafa? And what about the risk of violence in East Jerusalem? Good morning. Um, Israel has not yet set a deadline for the for its invasion of Rafah, but have made it clear that it will go ahead with the plan. Um, I think they paused this plan just to allow for ceasefire talks to materialize. 
probably before the start of Ramadan, like it was planned. Um, but today is Ramadan and there are no ceasefire talks um, advancing or progressing. Um, we know that CIA director is in the region. The Israelis are saying that we're trying to close some gaps um, between Israel and Hamas, but it seems that Hamas doesn't even want to uh, end the fighting during Ramadan. Now, as for the potential of uh, violence in East Jerusalem, this is definitely likely, and it is more frequent during Ramadan um, where um, Muslim Palestinians want to pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the violence is, um, tend to be between settlers and Palestinians or Israeli police and Palestinians. So given that this is a flashpoint and has been, um, it is likely to remain that way during the month of Ramadan. Okay, I just want to play U.S. President Joe Biden's warning for Israel here. Take a listen. There's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. So Biden saying that a Rafa invasion would be a red line. Donna, what does that mean practically, given the U.S. president has said he'd never cut off weapons supplies to Israel? He's affirmed Israel's right to fight Hamas. Right. So in his interview, like we were saying, he did say Rafah's invasion is a red line. But then when he was asked it again, he said there could never be a red line where I would stop uh, providing Israel with arm because Israel, uh, arms because Israel's defense is critical. But this just shows just... One, how frustrated um, the U.S. is growing with Israeli policies, especially um, given his criticism of uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and how he's handling the war, saying that he is hurting Israel. Um, and second, it just shows like how the U.S. is trying to balance this rhetoric, um, trying to push Israel not to go after Rafah, but at the same time, they cannot tarnish this longstanding relationship uh, between Israel and the U.S. And this is the U.S.'s most important ally in the region. Um, and it's a, there's another example of how uh, the U.S. has been trying to push Israel to allow more aid into Gaza, and that hasn't materialized very well. And then we saw um, a couple of, maybe two weeks ago, uh, where Palestinians were killed during aid distribution, and then that prompted the U.S. to start aid drops, and now trying to build this dock um, near the Mediterranean to allow more access of aid to, the Ga to Gazans. So it is kind of the U.S. is saying, you know, I'll take it in my own hands, and, I, and I'll do it with allies like the, U, uh, the EU, like the UAE and others. Um, and so this is just how the U.S. is trying to balance this rhetoric. They want to push Israel to do what the U.S. wants, which is agree on a ceasefire and not to go after Hamas in Rafah. But Israel is definitely, in definitely intends on doing exactly that. OK, Donna Kreish, we thank you for that update. And, of course, we will stay across the geopolitical story throughout the programme. Still ahead, traders are hedging bets on when the ECB and the Fed will start cutting rates. We'll get the outlook from Rasmala Investment Bank later in the hour. But next, hear why UBS Global Wealth Management says the dollar's lost ground and why they reckon it'll stay on the softer side. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. Now, China's annual session of parliament, the National People's Congress, wraps up in Beijing in a few hours, with perhaps more emphasis on what leaders didn't do than what they did do. So, for more, let's speak to our Greater China senior executive editor, John Liu, who's in Beijing. John, what's been your key takeaway from the MPC this year? Well, I think the main, the main thing that the leadership here in Beijing was trying to do was instill some confidence in the outlook for the economy. Uh, they, uh, they came out with a very ambitious 5% target for growth this year. What they did not do, as you referred to earlier, is they didn't really give us the details about how exactly they were going to get to that 5% growth. Uh, what they are also not doing this time is at the end of the MPC, when we usually would have had the premier uh, speaking to reporters in his annual press conference, that will not be happening this year uh, and in the foreseeable future. So again, uh, adding to the concern that there is less, less insight and transparency into how this economy is working. 
OK, Bloomberg's John Louis, thank you for that. And, of course, the MPC meeting today ends at 11 a.m. UAE time without a traditional press briefing from Premier Lee. Just in terms of the market reaction to the MPC so far, if we take a look at last week, you can see it, there was a fourth straight week of gains for onshore stocks, but a second week of losses for offshore stocks. Materials were the strongest sector on the Chinese MSCI. Real estate and consumer stocks were the biggest laggards and the offshore yuan a touch stronger in line with dollar weakness so that the market reaction to the npc which wraps up at 11 a.m uae time today well, the U.S. jobless rate climbed to a two-year high in February, even as hiring remained healthy, which points to a cooler and yet resilient labour market. The figures illustrate the type of softening in the job market that the Federal Reserve wants to see. But will it be enough for the central bank to start cutting rates? For more, to make sense of all of this confusion, let's bring in Wayne Gordon, Commodities and FX Managing Director at UBS Global Wealth Management. Great to have you on, Wayne. Uh, let's start nice then with the Fed. We had Jay Powell speaking last week uh, before the blackout period began on Saturday. We've got a raft of eco data this week. All eyes on the CPI print tomorrow, of course. Markets almost fully pricing a quarter point cut in June. But just in terms of the dollar, do you think it's going to stay on the softer side all the way to the Fed meeting? Well, let's just lay out, you know, our sort of view around the Fed. And we think the Fed start cutting rates around the June period. Um, clearly, that's been a little bit um, delayed uh, because some of the data around consumers was actually better than expected at the start of the year. Uh, but it's pretty clear now that the data is starting to cool a lot, and we think that will give the Fed a lot of comfort. Uh, that will enable them to start cutting. And, of course, it is going to be a synchronised central bank cutting, basically, across the G10, uh, with the exception of the Bank of Japan. Um, but having said that, um, there is a lot of length still uh, from a futures perspective in the dollar. We think that there are opportunities where some currencies outside the dollar are presenting pretty cheaply, such as the Australian dollar, even to some degree the pound. And so we think that that initial start of the Fed rate cuts will start to see the dollar weaken out. We sort of target on a 12 month basis around 112 to 114 against the euro. Yeah, I want to come back to the BOJ and the yen in just a moment. But on the Fed, of course, I said we, we're in the blackout period now. We've got this data this week. Do you think it'll be uh, market moving at all, the numbers we get this week? I think, I think that if CPI prints a little bit on the hotter side, uh, I think some of the pricing we've seen come through uh, in some areas, even like gold, for example, which has been really starting to price in uh, the Fed beginning to cut rates. And we've seen uh, futures markets in particular pushing heavily into gold over the last week. I think that's a little bit of ahead of itself if we see a CPI a bit on the hotter side. Uh, of course, if CPI continues to come down, uh, that's very much in, in line with market pricing. So I would expect that then you'll start to see some of these things uh, like the dollar begin to weaken out. Uh, but gold could actually extend its gains in that context. And you mentioned the Bank of Japan. Of course, we had those fourth quarter Japanese GDP figures this morning. Japan actually managing to avoid a technical recession. When do you expect the BOJ to pivot, Wayne? So we, we think that the BOJ will start to normalise, I guess, is probably the best way to describe what's about to happen at the Bank of Japan uh, over the next uh, couple of meetings. Um, I think it's a little bit early to start uh, talking about the end of YCC. Uh, but I definitely think that negative interest rate policy is going to be the first uh, step that the Bank of Japan will take. Um, of course, they are pretty reserved, right? And uh, this um, data print today, albeit sort of was expected by the market, um, does give them a bit more confidence, particularly if the wage negotiations which are ongoing show that wage growth is really starting to structurally remain elevated. Um, so we think those things are really important. Now, it might be a little bit early next week uh, to start to, to see the Bank of Japan take that first step, but we definitely think thereafter, which, which actually brings our sort of dollar-yen view into, into focus. And, of course, we think the dollar-yen ends up around the 140 or so by the time we get to the end of the year and into next.
Okay, interesting. And when you mentioned gold, I'm in Dubai for two weeks. I'm thinking about hitting up the gold souk. But I hear that it just keeps getting more and more expensive. People are getting put off the yellow metal. What's your outlook for the price? Am I any hope in the next fortnight? Well, look, on a, look from a 12-month basis, we've been advocating for around the sort of 2,250 type mark. Um, clearly, you know, gold has run a long way in a few weeks. And when we think about that relative to our fair value modelling of gold, um, gold prices are very extended right now. The premium above uh, that fair value modelling is quite extended. Um, that being said, there's a lot going on in the world and gold has proven itself to be a, an excellent hedge within a portfolio context. And so while we continue for people to hold gold in a, in a portfolio, we do think that gold prices are a little bit extended here, particularly ahead of the CPI numbers in the US, where, as I said, if they come a little bit on the hotter side, uh, this could see opportunities to buy gold at a lower price. OK, and I'm just interested as well in your outlook for oil demand, because it was interesting to see in Aramco's earnings that they say oil demand in China is growing. But then how do you square that with the China National Petroleum Corporation, the CNPC, saying that crude consumption growth is starting to slow? Look, I think it comes down to degrees here. Um, so, you know, with the soft landing in the United States, um, economies beginning to recover to some degrees, such as in Europe and so on. And also, we do expect that China growth will actually be, although the markets have been uh, uh, pretty lacklustre, China growth, um, the, 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 the target they have is around the 5%, uh, which does suggest that their demand for oil is going to continue. Now, um, the, the, growth, the growth of oil over the next sort of 12 months, maybe it's a little bit slower than what we've experienced over the last 12 months. But nonetheless, we still think the market will be either balanced or in deficit. That leaves us with prices about where they are now, if not slightly higher. Uh, so we still have a very positive view on oil prices from this point. Uh, it's just that, um, you know, growth is probably going to be a little bit on the slower side going into the second half. OK, Wayne Gordon, Commodities and FX Managing Director at UBS Global Wealth Management. Great to have you on the programme, as always. Thank you. Maybe I'll wait for that trip to the gold suit, hey? Plenty more are still ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. Now, despite falls in the oil price, the world's biggest crude exporter, Saudi Aramco, yesterday raised its dividend, having reported the second highest annual profit in its history. Aramco's payout is, of course, the most important source of revenue for the Saudi state. It's bankrolling the Crown Prince's programme to modernise the kingdom and diversify the economy. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Anthony De Paula. And Anthony, you've been all across these earnings from Aramco. In January, though, they surprised us by pausing the production capacity expansion plan. So what's the latest? Are they actually confident in the long-term demand for oil? Yeah, good morning, Lizzie. Well, they say that they are. They say that they're confident in the long-term demand, that they'll be able to place their oil. Uh, and they're confident as well uh, in the short term that they'll be able to continue uh, producing and continue selling into those great markets, those, those big markets for them like China, as you were talking about earlier in the show, and, and, and India as well. Uh, the issue here is that they were going to be moving up to 13 million barrels a day of capacity uh, in uh, 2027 from 12 now. Uh, Saudi Aramco has traditionally kept some spare capacity uh, in the market just in case there was an emergency, and so that's been a cost for them paying to keep oil a capacity that's unused. Mm. Uh, so now with these budget constraints, the kingdom is saying, look, let's not do that. Let's not put that money in. Uh, let's see where this takes us. Uh, the company uh, doesn't really have a say in that because that's a government, uh, a government directive and that's a government order for them to increase or to stop. 
They're confident, though, if they need to, if they need to bring that oil back on, they can do it quickly and, and increase some of, those, uh, some of those fields. But the government wants the money to be flowing so they can buy those expensive footballers. <laughs> what That's was correct. their update, though, on Aramco's talks for U.S. LNG projects? Was there an update? The update was they're interested, which, okay. uh, which we knew that they're looking at that. That's a business that they really want to get into. They've also set up a, a trading arm as well, too, and that's big into LNG. So they want to get some of those assets to trade around. They've got a lot of gas domestically. They've just uh, made some, some additional uh, discoveries in one of the big fields that they're working on. They're going to work on that to use uh, f that gas for power and to create uh, uh, hydrogen that they can export. So the power at home, hydrogen for export, and LNG they want to do elsewhere. They've bought into some assets in, uh, in Australia, and they're looking to do a similar kind of deal either on their own or with a partner in the United States. Okay, so these are how they're kind of bankrolling the uh, government plans to modernize the economy. But then we saw yesterday in the Saudi GDP <laughs> figures another drop. So what does that say for MBS's modernization plans? Yeah, well, what's really important here is that they need to take that, that oil income, put it into these other businesses, these other industries, and, and build those up for the future. Uh, those industries right now are not going to be making as much money as, as oil has, has ever made. So uh, it's an issue of trading off the, the money that they're bringing in now for the income that they're going to have in the future when there's going to be less income uh, from the oil and from the gas that they're selling. But we're talking a, a longer term period. Saudi Arabia and Saudi Aramco have a very long view on uh, continued demand for the, for the oil markets. They expect to be in this business for the next several decades. Uh, so, but they do need to bring this money in and start getting that into these programs now uh, that build up industries that can support uh, the, the GDP, can support the economy, create jobs without relying as much on the oil in the future, Lizzie. Yeah, because, of course, that budget deficit is forecast to last all the way to 2026. All right, Bloomberg's Anthony DiPaolo, we thank you for being across the macro and the micro, which are, of course, the same when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Well, let's get you up to speed on some of the other stories on the Bloomberg terminal today. Egyptian inflation unexpectedly accelerated last month, with consumer prices in urban areas rising 35.7% in the year to February. That was up from a reading just below 30 30% in January, with the pound's recent devaluation set to further increase import costs. Month on month, prices were up more than 11%, the fastest pace in records stretching back to 2007. Portugal's centre-right AD coalitions won elections held this weekend in a tight race, which also saw support for the far-right surge. With almost all votes counted, the AD secured 79 seats, two more than the socialists. Far-right party Chega, which was only founded in 2019, recorded the biggest jump, quadrupling its representation. Those are some of our top stories this morning. On the markets, you've got futures pointing to a lower opening. S&P E-minis are lower two-tenths of a percent. Eurostox futures, uh, Eurostox 50 futures lower two. And the MSCI Asia Pacific Index is currently lower 1.1 percent. Stay with us for more. We've got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa are top stories this morning. Japanese stocks slipped the most in months on growing speculation that the Bank of Japan will raise rates. Investors look ahead to US inflation data tomorrow after Friday's mixed jobs report. As the holy month of Ramadan begins, ceasefire talks remain deadlocked. US President Joe Biden warns Israel that invading Rafah would be a red line. Plus, Aramco's $31 billion gift. The world's biggest oil exporter ramps up its quarterly dividend despite lower oil prices, boosting revenues for the Saudi government. Well, it's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. Ramadan Kareem. And the mood, however, is risk off here. Uh, not just in Asia, but also as we look ahead to the opening in Europe and stateside too. It's the transmission of that downbeat mood from the end of the week where the question was, is this 
record after record breaking rally actually going to end. So you've got the MSCI Asia Pacific index down 1.2 percent, Euro stocks 50 futures down nearly seven tenths of a percent, S&P e minis down two tenths of a percent and Nasdaq futures down three tenths of a percent. All eyes now on that US jobs, uh, US CPI print tomorrow. Is this going to be the catalyst that resurrects the everything rally? If we flip over now to the cross asset picture though, you've got the 10 year yield pretty steady at the moment at 4.06 percent. Strength for the yen off the back of the news that Japan did manage to avoid a technical recession. Brent trading at $81.52, seven tenths of a percent weaker as we await the IEA and OPEC reports this week. And Bitcoin now at $68,000, so a way off that 70k mark that it managed to touch last week. But let's get more now on Asia markets, how they're faring with Avril Hong. She's on standby in our studio in Singapore. Avril. Yeah, Lizzie, let's talk about China. Lots to unpack there. We have the developer, Vanka, depositing money into an account which will allow it to make payments that are due on its bonds this week. Along with that, a Reuters report that the financial regulators have met with some institutions to urge large lenders to provide more support to developers. So all that might be providing a bit of a lift to sentiment, especially coming after a weekend where we got the consumer price number showing a lift for the first time after four months, although that might be a temporary effect from holiday-driven demand. Uh, the PBOC will get a chance to uh, show just how serious it is about fighting deflation later in the week when it announces its medium-term lending facility. Bloomberg Intelligence sees a cut, although the consensus is for a hold because of what a rate reduction would mean for lenders' margins as well as pressure on the yen. But let's see how the CSI 300 is shaping up today starting the week with that improved sentiment lifting things flip the board because I think where the negative sentiment is coming through is in the commodity space iron ore is sinking and it's going down to the lowest since October uh, last year because of what we did not hear from the Chinese NPC which of course wraps up today and I think that is the investor focus and no support uh, announced for the real estate property sector which of course is going to be close related to what we see on commodities demand, Lizzie. OK, Avril, and that NPC meeting wrapping up at 11 a.m. UAE time. We thank you. Avril Hong in Singapore. Now, let's get back to the U.S. macro story because we have got a raft of eco data coming out this week. But last week ended with the U.S. jobless rate climbing to a two-year high in February, even as hiring remained healthy. So it points to a cooler but still resilient labour market. And the figures illustrate the type of softening in the jobs market that the Federal Reserve wants to see. But will it be enough for the central bank to start cutting rates. Well, let's bring in Eric Swartz, the vice chairman of Rasmala Investment Bank. Maybe you can tell us, Eric, since this data is so confusing. Uh, we get lots more numbers this week. What do you reckon are the chances that the Fed spares its own projections of, changes its projections of three rate cuts this year? Well, uh, given that we have seen uh, higher than expected inflation levels, uh, over the past couple of months in the U.S., uh, the next inflation report is very, very important. Should we continue to see an elevated rate of inflation uh, in the U.S., as well as the fact that the economy, particularly the labor market, still remains quite robust, it could well be that we see the Federal Reserve pare back mm. the interest rate cut expectations. We've seen over the past several uh, weeks, you know, a cut expectations of six cuts to three cuts, exactly. and quite likely we would see a move to two cuts unless we start to see greater uh, actions, greater progress in terms of moving inflation rates down. Which, of course, plays into the currency picture as well. But let's talk about the BOJ, because, of course, we had that GDP data this morning. What do you think are the chances the BOJ bites the bullet at the March meeting? Well, I'm not sure about the March meeting, but it's highly likely that they will look to normalize uh, interest rate policy, uh, raising rates into a uh, positive uh, place. And we've already started to see more uh, activity in the longer term uh, bonds uh, in Japan, which is, again, part of their yield curve strategy and a loosening of the yield curve strategy, which I think are all like steps in the direction towards normalizing uh, policy 
uh, efforts in Japan. Okay, and if we can turn a little closer to here, the GCC has had a kind of pre-Ramadan fl flurry of activity, but longer term, what's your outlook for uh, equity markets in this region? Well, we're positive on the equity markets uh, for, the, uh, for the region. Uh, in particular, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and the United Arab Emirates. Mm. There is a great opportunity for uh, investment gains in uh, sectors which we uh, think have you know, strong uh, domestic secular growth uh, behind them. This can include education mm. uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, as well as uh, uh, digitalization with respect to the government's programs are the particular and the companies. Yeah, there are a couple that we're very positive on. With respect to the education sector, uh, we like NCLE uh, as well as uh, Atata. And within the digitalization uh, technology sector, we prefer those companies uh, that are uh, vendors. And this includes Elms uh, as well as Solutions. And you mentioned Saudi. We've just been talking about Aramco's earnings there, but also the GDP picture for Saudi, that data out yesterday. When you've got plans, the modernization plans having to be delayed because of the budget deficit, where do you stand? Would you be buying Saudi bonds? Well, Saudi bonds are uh, strong credits. Um, as strong as any in the region. And so when we look at Saudi Arabia and our fixed income investments, we tend to focus on duration plays. And when we expect long-term yields to be uh, declining, then we'll be looking at uh, long-term uh, Saudi government bonds as well as government bonds from uh, Abu Dhabi so that the yields would move down along with Treasury yields. Mm. Over the most recent period, we've seen yield spreads narrow a little bit, 10 to 15 basis points uh, against U.S. Treasuries, which uh, have been performing uh, well. And so, you know, that shows that uh, investors, you know, on the fixed income side are, are comfortable with the credit risks in Saudi Arabia. Okay. And speaking of Aramco, what's your outlook for oil demand? Well, at this point in time, we still uh, see that the uh, global economy is in is on uh, shaky grounds, mm. uh, notwithstanding the strength of the U.S., which has been, how should I say, surprising, <laughs> right? But China itself uh, is weak, and it seems that there are not really solid uh, proposals to support uh, the Chinese economy at this point in time. And as a result of that, you know, we've seen oil prices remain let's say, elevated, really on the back of supply cuts, not on demand increases. And so at that point, you know, we really see it a, a balance between these supply cuts and growth in economic activity, which from our perspective is shaky. And so we are not looking for strong oil prices from this point in time. Lastly, Eric, I just want to get your take on the Egyptian currency devaluation. Do you think that it will attract portfolio in inflows? And how long do you think it's going to take investors to need to feel confident about FX stabilization before they buy that debt? <clears throat> um, the Egyptian story is a, is a complex one at this point in time mm. uh, from our perspective. Uh, I'm not certain that a devaluation of the currency and this increase in interest rates will solve uh, the problems facing Egypt at this point in time. So our perspective is really one of a, a cautious uh, wait and see. Uh, Egypt itself is involved in this Israel-Gaza mm -hmm. uh, war, uh, sitting right on the border of the uh, Gaza Strip. And as a result of that, there could well be less tourism taking place uh, within Egypt, which has an impact on their ability to produce uh, foreign currency reserves. And while we see investments coming from the UAE uh, in Saudi Arabia, possibly uh, at this point in time, I think the noteworthy uh, impact or the noteworthy aspect is that the countries are no longer making deposits with the central bank which had been the way that they'd provide support in the past. But now they're looking at making acquisitions, uh, buying up assets or land in this instance, as a way to support the uh, Egyptian economy. And that's quite different than, I think, the way it's been done in the past. OK. They might have managed to, cons to persuade the IMF, but, Eric, it's going to take a bit more time to persuade you. <laughs> Eric Swartz, the vice chairman of Rasmala Investment Bank, we thank you for joining us, as always.
Now, India has signed a free trade pact with four European countries that the Modi government says will create one million jobs over 15 years. The deal with non-EU countries, including Switzerland and Norway, has been 16 years in the making. Well, let's get more now from Bloomberg's Ruchi Bhatia from New Delhi. Ruchi, what do these countries want out of India? Hi, Lizzie. It's good to be on the show with you. Well, yes, you're right. The EFTA block or the uh, four countries that is Switzerland, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, uh, they pact, the trade pact with them was under negotiation for almost 16 years. And the pact will see almost $100 billion being invested in the South Asian country over a period of 15 years as many as 1 million jobs that have been created. What is quite interesting from India's perspective is that uh, the pact includes a binding commitment and something that uh, the Indian government will look to emulate in some of the other FTAs as well. India is one of the most populous countries. It is a fast-growing major economy, a major market, and this is what uh, uh, the EFTA nations are looking at. Uh, the EFTA nations want to continue to deepen their market access in India, and uh, India, on the other hand, is looking to benefit fit uh, as uh, more and more countries are looking to diversify their supply chains away from China. The agreement will also benefit the pharmaceutical industry, the medical devices industry in the block for Indian exporters. They're going to get uh, liberalized access for rice and some of the other uh, products as well. Uh, for, uh, Swiss, uh, uh, for, for the Swiss, uh, you know, we believe uh, that uh, their uh, high-end watches, uh, their expensive chocolates will become cheaper in India. However, in a phased manner, uh, uh, as I told you, in it has offered market access in a, a non-discriminatory uh, treatment uh, for various sectors, including health, banking, insurance services, etc. In fact, what was quite interesting is that uh, we, uh, for the first time ever, it, it's a modern agreement of sorts, and we've seen chapters including labor, environment, and gender as well. So all in all, uh, this is an ideal pact that the Indian government wanted coming in uh, just uh, a few days ahead of the national polls being announced, uh, and the pact will also in include, uh, uh, and uh, 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 the pact will also include uh, the fact that Indian professionals will now be able to move much more smoothly. Uh, uh, however, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Swiss parliament uh, is yet to uh, ratify the deal and uh, the process on that will begin uh, pretty fast. So an eye on the domestic for India as well. But internationally is this a good omen for the trade deals that are already in the works between india and the eu and the uk and australia notoriously hard to get a trade deal with india well, absolutely india has been uh, working uh, very hard to forge deeper ties with some of its major trade tra uh, trading partners because india wants to become a manufacturing power house create the millions of jobs for its uh, large workforce and what we do understand is uh, that in the latest uh, you know the, the latest uh, trade pact that has uh, uh, been done coming in just ahead of the polls will definitely set the tune for some of the other pacts that are are in the making. For example, the uh, pact with UK, where uh, India is uh, negotiating very hard for a breakthrough, uh, which now seems uh, that uh, now will continue only after uh, the national elections. There is a uh, pact in the works with the European Union, and that's going to be a big one. India and Oman are very close to concluding their trade deal. Uh, India has already signed a free trade agreement with the UAE and is in talks with uh, a trade pact of sorts with the Gulf uh, uh, countries as well. So, uh, yes, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, FTA trade uh, pact has come in at the right time, and India is looking to do more and more trade talks. But uh, you're right, clinching some of those uh, is not going to be very easy. Mm. Rushi, you've got me thinking about Swiss chocolates now. We're going to have to take a break so I can run to the pantry. Bloomberg's <laughs> Rushi Bhatti, we thank you for that update. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai and I just want to take you to Japanese markets right now because the topics is tanking. It's down more than 3% currently. This is off the back of that GDP data for the fourth quarter earlier. Actually, Japan managed to avoid a technical recession and it seems to be feeding into the idea that the BOJ needs to normalise policy next week. So you've seen strength in the yen. Currently, it's trading at a 146 handle, so higher a tenth of a percent. But this is weighing on Japanese stocks. So the topic's down more than 3%, down 3.1% currently. But now, let's go over to Africa. We'll get the latest from Nigeria and its mounting cost of living crisis. The price of some vital food staples have doubled in a matter of months in the West African nation, with trucks hauling items like rice and pasta being hijacked along rural highways. For more on this, we're joined now by Bloomberg's Ondiro Oganga, who is in Kigali. Ondiro, what's behind this growing unrest in parts of Nigeria? I read that it isn't just uh, the poorest in society who are being affected by this inflation. Lizzie, there's a growing desperation in the country stemming from the aggressive reforms introduced by President Bola Ahmed Tinibu, maybe currently being dubbed as Tinibunomics. When he was sworn into power in May, his first order of business was to scrap off fuel subsidy. And though they were really costly to the government, they were a form of relief immediately after pump prices doubled, transport prices tri tripled, and this trickled down to the cost of goods and services. We also saw him liberalize the FX market, and from that, the narrow has plunged 70 percent to the dollar since June. Coupled with insecurity in the country and particularly in food producing regions, the cost of food has really gone up. And Nigeria is a country where an average household spends at least 50 percent of their revenue on food. So we are having the World Food Program warning that this year alone 26 million people face food shortage and food insecurity. And the IMF is calling for the government to put in place measures that will curb this rising challenge. Okay, so that's the economic story. Though turning to Ethiopia, why is the nation reconsidering the recognition of Somaliland as a sovereign state? Lizzie, we are seeing this reconsideration because there's mounting political and diplomatic pressure on Ethiopia to pull back because we are even seeing the U.S. say the region cannot afford any more tension. And so when Ethiopia's premier, Abiy Ahmed, was in Nairobi, he expressed to Pre President William Ruto that he's very much willing to step back from the controversial elements of the deal that they have with Somaliland, something that President William Ruto also raised with Somali's president, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, who was in Nairobi at the same time. However, Somaliland is not reading from the same Kumbaya script. If anything, the ambassador at large says that they're very committed to their deal with Ethiopia, but Ethiopia's access to the port solely lies on them formally recognizing Somaliland as a sovereign state. Okay, Bloomberg's Ondiro Aganga with the latest out of Africa from Kigali. We thank you. Coming up next, we're going to talk Boeing and the latest mishap for Boeing with the United Airlines aircraft running off the taxiway into a grassy area, landing at Houston on Friday. More on that with Danny Lee next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak, Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai and we're coming up to 9 a.m. here in the Emirates. Now, the U.S. Justice Department has opened a criminal investigation into the January mid-air blowout of a Boeing 737 MAX fuselage panel on an Alaska Airlines flight. The airline says this is standard practice for the DOJ and that it doesn't believe it's the target of the inquiry. But let's get more now from Bloomberg's Danny Lee. Danny, you've been all across this story from the very start. Boeing doesn't have records for what appears to be, have been, a faulty repair shortly before the jet was delivered last year. I mean, just put into context for us, how unusual is that? Yeah, I mean, well, Boeing is 
admitted that it hasn't got any records, any documentation in relation to work it did on a door panel, this same door panel, which subsequently blew out midair in early January on an Alaska Airlines flight. Now, this incident had, has heaped a whole heap of scrutiny on Boeing subsequently. Uh, and it's you know, problematic because as an investigation continues into, uh, a, a accident investigation continues into trying to find out what has happened, uh, it's pretty difficult for investigators to maybe pin down as quickly as possible for what happened. And of course, uh, for a door panel to blow out in mid-flight, it, it has been suggested that uh, four bolts which would keep this door panel in place were not put back on after they were taken off on this door. And Boeing's response, in fact, is in relation to uh, a comment last week in Congress at a Senate committee hearing. Uh, the U.S. National Transportation Safety Chair Jennifer Homendy condemning Boeing, condemning Boeing for its lack of cooperation into the ongoing investigation, and so it is a, a bit of a headache from that part. But as you said, also at the top, uh, we also heard over the weekend that the DOJ, the Department of Justice, has opened a criminal inquiry into uh, this uh, accident on this Alaska Airlines accident. Uh, Alaska obviously has said that it doesn't believe it's the target of the investigation. The DOJ hasn't said anything uh, official and Boeing hasn't also commented either. Yeah, so a United Airlines aircraft as well ran off the taxiway into a grassy area after landing at Houston on Friday. Very briefly, Danny, what more do we know about this other Boeing mishap? Yeah, this uh, aircraft, another Max jet, uh, it uh, landed at Houston, but uh, in conditions, uh, it, it was a, uh, uh, this plane just uh, sped uh, off the runway and into this grassy area. And of course, with any kind of accident or, or incident, this heaps more uh, scrutiny on Boeing, but we don't believe this necessarily is a, an issue for uh, Boeing, but more for uh, United Airlines in this. And uh, the investigation is ongoing. OK, Danny Lee, we thank you for that update on all things Boeing and the DOJ investigation, which we will keep across for you here on Bloomberg. We're currently looking at futures stateside pointing to a lower opening as they are in Europe. Eurostoxx 50 futures are lower seven tenths of a percent. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index is currently lower 1.2 percent and Japanese stocks taking a particular beating. The topics down three percent this morning. Stay with us for more. We'll be talking Talking more on the Middle East and Africa across the next hour, this is Bloomberg. Daybreak Middle East and Africa are top stories this morning. Japan's tanking topic stocks slipped the most in months on growing speculation the BOJ will raise rates. Investors look ahead to U.S. inflation data tomorrow after Friday's mixed jobs report. As the holy month of Ramadan begins, ceasefire talks remain deadlocked. U.S. President Joe Biden warns Israel that invading Rafa would be a red line. Plus, Aramco's $31 billion gift to the world's biggest oil exporter ramps up its quarterly dividend despite lower oil prices, boosting revenues for the Saudi government. All that and more coming up. It is just past 9 a.m. across the Emirates, 7 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zapasaja. And I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. Ramadan Kareem, if you celebrate, and happy Monday. Let's just check on these markets for you. The risk-off mood has transmitted from Friday into the new week. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index is lower 1.3% almost. The topics, as Jen says, really getting a beating from that GDP print earlier in the morning. And as we look ahead to the open on Europe, uh, lower six tenths of a percent. US futures also pointing to a lower open as we look ahead to that CPI print tomorrow. And if we flip over to the cross-asset picture, you've got Treasury yields pretty steady this morning. The 10-year here at 4.06%. And as I mentioned, that yen strength uh, currently at a 146 handle off the back of that GDP print. Japan avoiding a technical recession. Jen, what are you seeing? 
Yeah, that's right, Lizzie. Look, let's keep taking a look at some cross assets. In, in particular, if we take a look at where oil is, oil is holding on to losses uh, this Monday morning. If we look at Brent crude uh, right now, it, it's down uh, about six tenths of a percent right there. It's right now trading at eighty-one fifty-four dollars a barrel. Uh, WTI is also pushing lower uh, right now at seventy-seven forty-four dollars. We're awaiting uh, reports from OPEC and also the IEA, which might, may provide some clarity about demand outlook uh, later this week. Uh, also, we're taking a look at Bitcoin right now at 68,576, uh, a little bit of downside, but of course had a pretty uh, volatile week last year, uh, pulling back a bit after it touched $70,000 on Friday for the first time ever. Uh, also, the interesting story, the picture here with iron ore uh, down more than 4%. Right now, iron ore is the weakest major commodity uh, that we're tracking at present, uh, and there's more losses potentially in store if we take a look at China's uh, under overwhelming NPC meeting that is wrapping up uh, later today. But that's just a look at some of those cross assets there. But let's stick with Asia and see how markets in Asia are faring. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio. Hey, Avril. Hey, ladies. Yeah, we're focusing on Japan, especially given what we're seeing on the Japanese currency as well as the stock benchmarks in the country. And on the back of that data from GDP print showing that Japan avoided a recession in the last quarter as there was an upward revision, that was still lower than what market expected. But still, avoiding the technical recession, that seems to be boosting the case for a negative uh, or the end of a BOJ's negative rate policy. But that being said, I just wanted to highlight that we already saw the strengthening of the Japanese currency ahead of that data dropping because of reports from the likes of GG Press talking about how the BOJ is mulling the end of not just negative rate policy, but also yield control, that it wants to focus not just on the yield levels, but the volume of bond purchases. So that's what we're seeing on Japanese currency. Let's for the board take a look at the stock benchmarks in the country. We showed you the Nikkei and how it's been performing for much of today, the broad-based gauge, the topics seeing almost every sector losing ground today. No thanks to the strength in the Japanese currencies. Those export-related stocks, they're taking a beating today. And we're actually seeing the topics also declining by the most since October last year. And our MLive colleagues have pointed out that timing is part of all this because as the fiscal year wraps up, investors might be taking money off the table. Uh, not much sentiment to drive it along right now. Guys. Avril Hong in Singapore, we thank you for that update. I feel like International Women's Day has continued here on Bloomberg. What a lineup we've got for you this morning. But let's get back to the geopolitical story. Ramadan has begun, but ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas appear to be deadlocked. The US had hoped for a six week pause in fighting and the release of hostages, of Israeli hostages, in exchange for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. Without a deal, Israel threatens to invade Rafa, where more than a million Palestinians are sheltering. <laughs> That's right, Lizzie. Let's shift focus, though, uh, onto Asia. China's consumer prices rose for the first time since August, breaking a contraction streak that had put growth potential in the world's second largest economy under pressure. For more, let's bring in our China EcoGov reporter, Lucille Liu, who is joining us for more and been following this story. So, Lucille, what exactly are the implications now for China's growth prospects? This has been something we've been paying very close attention to over the past few months. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all know how sensitive deflation is here. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so last month we did, we did see CPI go up 0.7%. Uh, I think we had uh, the Bloomberg survey uh, economists predict 03 So that is, um, it is the beat there. But of course, the economists are saying that this is not going to last. They basically say it's because of the lunar Chinese New Year holidays. And also because we had quite extreme weather in mid-February, which really pushed up prices um, so, yeah, unfortunately, not something we expect to last. And of course, even with the New Year, uh, the Chinese New Year spending, uh, we did see data there that showed wild trips increase. So the total spending was up. The per capita spend was down as people were becoming more frugal um, as, you know, sentiment has really dropped here. And you've got the National People's Congress wrapping up in about two hours. Is there anything we should be watching out for as lawmakers end this high-profile meeting? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of investors have been saying that this has really been a bit of a nothing burger, that, you know, things have been... They, there wasn't <laughs> a big stimulus, there wasn't a big announcement. 
Um, so, you know, for the wrap up, we are expecting the passing of this state council organic law that basically just codifies sort of what's already in practice, which is that the government, the state council, uh, really answers to the party and, of course, you know, uh, is subservient to, uh, you know, see thought and, uh, you know, yeah, so basically putting the state council in place there. Um, of course, the implications there, analysts are saying, you know, this makes it harder in the future, of course, if, you know, the state council wants to um, come come out from under that, they will have to, you know, re uh, revise the law again. Um, and also it makes it harder for the premier to make independent decisions that aren't, you know, approved by President Xi himself. And, of course, we're not going to get the traditional press briefing from Premier Lee at the end of today. Even more of a nothing burger. Bloomberg's Lucille Liu, we thank you for being across that Congress. Still ahead, the Biden administration is said to be weighing sanctions on several Chinese tech companies. We'll bring you more on that story later in the hour. But up next, hear why Neovision Wealth Management says the latest jobs report out of the US is a wolf with a sheep disguise. That's next on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai. Now, the US jobless rate has climbed to a two year high in February, even as hiring remained healthy, which points to a cooler but resilient labour market. The figures illustrate the type of softening in the job market that the Federal Reserve wants to see, but will it be enough for the central bank to start cutting rates? Let's try and get some analysis from Ryan Lamont, co founder and CEO of Neovision Wealth Management. Maybe, Ryan, you could make sense of all this confusing data that we keep getting out of the US. But I want to start on US equities, if you don't mind, because we did see a bit of a downbeat mood at the end of last week. It seems like people are questioning whether this record after record breaking rally is coming to an end. Could the CPI print on when tomorrow, I should say, actually be the catalyst that resurrects the mood? Good morning. Thanks for having me again. I think it's no secret. I've, I've been saying it for quite a few months here on the show that we're contrarians. We don't believe in this rally, in this tech rally, even though it's happening. But it's, it's, it's just senseless because it resembles very much what we saw in year 2000. I was much younger, mm -hmm. but it's very much like it. And we believe it's most likely it will end in tears. And I'm happy to take this responsibility uh, for saying this. So uh, I think people are realizing it. The parallel with Cisco in year 2000 is very striking. Cisco was the only company producing routers when Internet came to be in year 2000. And today it's NVIDIA with GPUs and, 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 uh, and chips. So will it be the same? We think yes. I think people are realizing it as well, especially the older people who have been here in uh, year 2000. Well, so then, Ryan, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that you point out that you're a contrarian and also that you were much younger back then uh, when we saw something similar to this. So then uh, back to Lizzie's question. I mean, what is actually going to stop this rally from happening? Because there's no signs uh, that are pointing to what it is that you're saying. Well, there are several things that can happen. Uh, the obvious ones is un unemployment going up, commercial real estate, regional banks, and some, something related to NVIDIA itself and AI itself. I mean, Sam Altman got fired just a few months ago in a very surprise move, and then how he's back. So it's a very young industry that is still developing, and there are many accidents that can happen that can wake up people. Uh, and then there's geopolitics. We have rarely seen such positive correlation between geopolitical events across the world. Uh, you ask Iran, North Korea, South Korea, China, Taiwan, Ukraine. So there's a lot of positive correlation in these geopolitical events that can also trigger uh, a few things. That's why we prefer to stay in let's say, not so much overvalued markets and stay away from overvalued markets. OK, so you're in the camp that warns about the concentration risk. I'm interested that you mentioned about regional banking because it's a year to the day since Silicon Valley banks collapse. How much more of a crisis do you actually see in re regional banking then? Well, look at the New York Community Bank. I mean, um, just a few months ago, it was a $10 billion uh, mm -hmm. uh, market cap bank. Today, it's officially a penny stock. So we think there's more to happen, and this will be triggered by the commercial real estate. So the CDOs of 2008 
is today's commercial real estate. And we think the crisis is not yet over because it's, it's quite, quite big. Ryan, let's pivot to China because, of course, we mentioned this is the last day of the NPC meeting. Uh, our MLive poll survey uh, talks about how investors still feel like they need more convincing in terms of being bullish on China. But I know you and your team uh, are not necessarily sitting on the sidelines. I mean, is this still a market that you uh, are continuing to be bullish on? Yes, we, we took the sidelines, actually, until prices went to levels that were absolutely senseless. So it's the complete opposite of what we're seeing in the US, where prices are very, very high. In China, they went to, to levels where it's, it's a no-brainer. It's a screaming buy. And that's why we started stepping in. And we're happy to take a few percentage uh, points down until we think the Chinese government steps in with something more serious. And this is when we see a big snap up of, of Chinese stocks. So yeah, we're starting to put on positions on very specific Chinese stocks. Absolutely. A screaming buy for China but then what's your outlook for oil demand with China as a kind of factor into that? Because you've had Aramco saying that oil demand is growing in China, but we were talking about this before, the CMPC saying that crude consumption growth is starting to slow. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, on oil, we're looking at the supply side mm. because on the supply side, um, uh, there will be a crunch eventually because if you look at uh, capital expenditures happening on the supply side, whether it's upstream or downstream, 85% uh, of this capex is replacement capex. But if you look at the total capex, it's actually 30% lower than what, what we have seen a few years back. So if demand ticks up just a little bit, there will be a supply crunch. And that's why we are still positive on, uh, on oil. Uh, China, uh, there will be an increase in demand if the Chinese government or when the Chinese government steps in and uh, supports the economy. If and when, Ryan, that is the big uh, question. Uh, really appreciate you being on, though, and giving us your insights. Ryan Lamont, uh, co-founder and CEO of NeoVision Wealth Management, joining us there in studio in Dubai. All right, plenty more still ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Now, Ramadan has begun, but ceasefire talks between Israel and Hamas appear to be deadlocked. The US had hoped for a six-week pause in fighting and the release of dozens of Israeli hostages in return for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. Without a deal, Israel's threatened to invade Rafah, where more than a million Palestinians are sheltering. Joining us now for the latest is Bloomberg's Dana Kreish. Dana... Do we know when or if Israel would invade Rafah and what about the violence risk in East Jerusalem as well? Yes, well, we don't have an exact deadline for when Israel would invade Rafah. They do intend on doing so, and they have made that clear several times. Um, they kind of paused the plans to allow for ceasefire talks to materialize, which were supposed to materialize this week with the start of Ramadan. But today is Ramadan, and that hasn't happened yet. So um, we know CIA directors still in the region. The Israelis said they're trying to close gaps um, in those talks, um, but they said that Hamas kind of intends on not having a break during Ramadan. As for the violence in East Jerusalem, this is more frequent during Ramadan and has happened before, and that's why the concern now is rising as the start of Ramadan and Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians, want to pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, the violence would usually be between Israeli settlers and Palestinians or Israeli police and Palestinians, but given that this is and has been a flashpoint, this might and likely to happen again um, at the start of Ramadan and during the holy month, too. And Donna, that makes what President Biden said over the weekend that much more interesting in terms of the fault lines between he and Netanyahu. Let's listen to it really quick, and then we'll talk to you after. There's red lines that if he crosses, and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with. The, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. So, Donna, considering those words, I mean, what does this actually mean uh, in terms of the U.S.'s support for Israel, uh, especially given sort of what you just outlined there in terms of the start of, of Ramadan and the increased violence that, that we'll potentially see? Right, so President Biden did say that 
going after Hamas in Rafah would be a red line. But at the same time, um, when he was asked again, he said it's a red line doesn't mean that I would stop providing arms to Israel. And he said Israel's defense is critical. So the big question is, what does a red line mean? What leverage does the U.S. have over Israel to stop it or convince it to maybe postpone or... Um, you know, stop the uh, invasion of Rafah. Now, it, it's kind of like they're threading, going or, or walking a very thin line here, uh, uh, President Biden and the U.S. with Israel. Um, the U.S. is trying to convince it to do something, and they're trying to balance this rhetoric, saying, um, don't do this, but at the same time, we won't um, impact Israel's defense. And this is the U.S.'s most important ally in the region, and they don't want to tarnish this longstanding relationship. And that, in an example for that is, how the U.S. had been trying to convince Israel to better organize aid into Gaza, allow more access to it, and then the U.S. took it in its own hands, um, doing the aid drops into Gaza, and now trying to build a dock on the eastern, uh, on the Mediterranean coast to allow more aid into Gaza. So this is just how shows how frustrating the, the U.S. is growing over um, Israel, and particularly Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister's um, the way of handling the war. And we saw in this interview as well how President Biden said that ben Benjamin Netanyahu is hurting Israel rather than helping it with the way he's handling the war. Right, and it was interesting to hear Netanyahu's uh, comments responding to that. Uh, Bloomberg's Donna Karish uh, joining us in Dubai. Donna, thanks so much for that report. Let's turn now uh, to the region, Saudi Arabia. Now, despite falls in the oil price, the world's biggest crude exporter, Saudi Aramco, yesterday raised its dividend, having reported the second highest annual profit in its history. Saudi Aramco's payout is, of course, the most important source of revenue for the Saudi state. It's bankrolling the Crown Prince's program to modernize the kingdom and also diversify the economy. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Anthony DiPaolo, who is following the story. So, Anthony, in January, we heard from Aramco. They said they, they, were surpri they surprised us in terms of pausing their production capacity expansion plans. I mean, what, how are you reading into this latest earnings and this latest news from the company? Uh, good morning. Yeah, uh, they, they did uh, pull back that plan to increase capacity. That was going to be bringing new uh, capacity to produce more oil online by 2027. Uh, they were going to go up from 13 million barrels a day to 12 million, uh, excuse me, to 13 from 12. Of course, they're not producing that now. Uh, they're producing uh, on, on crude around nine, uh, around the nine-ish level due to the OPEC plus cuts as they're trying to tighten up the current market. But what we're probably going to see towards the end of the decade is, is, a, is a tightening crude market as uh, Saudi Aramco doesn't bring uh, that additional capacity online. Potentially, we see some other investments from other producers uh, that are kind of tapping out by that point. And so we see, do see a tightening market. So I think that's probably what the Saudis are banking on, is having more bang for their buck in terms of a higher oil price for a, a, a lesser amount of oil that they, could, that they can produce, but they'll be getting more for that. So if they're producing, uh, you know, upwards of 10, uh, between that 10 and 12 area, that's kind of where they have traditionally produced. And if they're getting more money for that, that's going to be better. That's going to continue helping to reproduce these high earnings like we've seen uh, for uh, 2023. This was their second highest net income after that bumper year of 2022. And that allowed them to use some of those 2022 uh, earnings to, to increase the dividend, both the base and a special dividend, to give a great payout to the uh, Saudi government uh, for, for this year, Jennifer. Okay, so that's oil, but of course, also Aramco's got some pretty far-flung LNG product projects. Were there any updates on those? Yeah, I mean, gas is another big component for uh, for Saudi Aramco. Uh, they're really leaning on some domestic fields to supply power at home and then to potentially produce hydrogen for export. But what they want to do externally is they want to get into LNG, so liquefied natural gas, that's the gas that they can load on tankers, ship all over the world. They're looking at the U.S. That's one of the big markets there because we have so many of those shale fields uh, that you'll see coming online uh, there. And they're, they're really looking to get into that market as a, as a big export market. They did buy into uh, a stake in a, in a company with some assets in uh, Australia uh, earlier this year. And so they're looking to finish that deal. Uh, as well as expand their kind of portfolio of these gas assets globally. So U.S. is really one of the areas of interest for them, they, they told journalists uh, yesterday, Lizzie. Uh, Anthony, how does this position Saudi, and, and in particular uh, 
Mohammed bin Salman, his plans uh, to transform the kingdom and the economy. I mean, how does all of this sort of position those big, ambitious plans that we've been hearing about for so long? Yeah, well, we've heard about those plans like uh, building the new Neom City that's going to be on the Red Sea. Uh, they are building up sports. So there was the uh, F1 this weekend. Uh, they've, they've brought in these famous football players like, uh, like Ronaldo uh, to really get some publicity around that. Uh, those are the big headline projects eye-catching, but what they really need to do is build these new industries. Uh, we've written in the past about them trying to do mining, uh, some manufacturing, uh, trying to do some electric car. Uh, manufacturing in the kingdom. So they really need to take that oil income while it's coming in and get it into building these new industries that are going to create jobs, that's going to create that non-oil income that they're going to need over the next coming decades to keep the, the economy going. Uh, Saudi Aramco has got a very long view on, on the oil market, so they expect to be uh, selling oil uh, for transport, for chemicals, selling gas over the next uh, several decades. Uh, but they are going to need to use that money while it's coming in uh, to invest in these industries for the future, Jennifer. Mm. Okay, Bloomberg's Anthony DiPaolo, we thank you for that update on the Aramco earnings and Saudi GDP. Stay with us for more. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. Japan's tanking topic, stocks slipped the most in months on growing speculation the BOJ will raise rates. Investors now look ahead to U.S. inflation data tomorrow after Friday's mixed jobs report. As the holy month of Ramadan begins, ceasefire talks remain deadlocked. U.S. President Joe Biden warns Israel that invading Rafah would be a red line. Plus, Aramco's $31 billion gift, the world's biggest oil exporter, ramps up its quarterly dividend despite lower oil prices, boosting revenues for the Saudi government. It is just past 9.30 a.m. across the Emirates, 7.30 a.m. here in Johannesburg. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja. And I'm Lizzie Burden in Dubai. Good morning. Happy uh, welcome to Monday and, of course, Ramadan Kareem. <laughs> if you look at markets, it is risk off, however. You've got the MSCI Pacific Index lower 1.2%. So following the risk off mood from Friday's session, the sense that this rally in stocks could be over. Will they get a catalyst, however, from the CPI report tomorrow? You've got U European futures also pointing to a lower opening, lower six tenths of a percent and on Wall Street we're in the red as well. If we flip over to the cross asset picture as we wait for that CPI report and digest that mixed jobs report that we got on Friday you've got the 10 year treasury yield holding steady at 4.06 percent and the yen is weaker now at a 146 handle uh, there uh, after we had that GDP print this morning. Yeah, that's right, Lizzie. Uh, let's take a look further at cross assets. In particular, if we take a look at where oil is, uh, Brent crude uh, down right now about six tenths of a percent uh, at 81.58 uh, right now. Uh, WTI is also pushing lower, and we're awaiting monthly reports from OPEC and also the IEA, potentially helping us to provide some clarity in terms of the demand outlook. Uh, oil had a pretty volatile week last week, actually the most volatile since 2021. Uh, another but pretty fascinating week was uh, for Bitcoin. Bitcoin right now uh, holding just over 68,000, uh, pulling back slightly. Uh, and that is, of course, coming after it touched $70,000 for the first time on Friday. So we'll have to pay attention to what the week uh, looks like for Bitcoin. And finally, iron ore uh, starting off the week uh, lower as well, down uh, more than 4%. It's one of the weakest. It is the weakest major commodity at present. And, and really, a lot of this is due to China's underwhelming NPC meeting that is wrapping up uh, later today. So that is more of your cross-asset picture. But let's stick with markets in Asia. Avril Hong is in our Singapore studio for more. Hey, Avril. Hey, Jen. Yeah, we're really focusing on Japan today, given the speculation that's rising of a move from the BOJ next week. Indeed, the fuel being added by that GG report today, saying that the central bank is mulling not just an exit from negative rate policy, but also yield control. And this could come in the form of focusing less on the yield levels, but more on the volumes of buyings of bonds. Uh, we're seeing that bear steepening in the Japanese bond space, the topics declining as much 
much as 3 plus percent earlier. That was the steepest loss since uh, March last year. Pairing some of that as we head towards the close of the session, Nikkei is still deep in negative territory. And of course, it's not just because of the GDP print that's fueling those bets. We also have wage negotiations that are underway. That is going to be key to watch as to when the BOJ actually exits. Let's flip the board and take a very quick look at what we're seeing on the movers in the equity space. It is the tech names that are the drags on the Japanese benchmark and indeed on the MSCI Asia Pacific. No thanks to what we're seeing out of the AI and the chip counterparts in the US last week. A bit of profit uh, taking underway also because of the strength of the Japanese yen. But Chinese names, a bit of a bright spot today. And this is on the back of that CPI data that we got over the weekend, guys. Yes, the yen strengthening, I should say, and hitting the topics off the back of that GDP print. Avril Hong in Singapore, we thank you for that look at Asia markets. And we're going to stay with Asia because India has signed a free trade pact with four European countries that the Modi government says will create one million jobs in 15 years. The deal with non-EU countries, including Switzerland and Norway, has been 16 years in the making. They always say it's hard to do a trade deal with India. Well, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ruchi Bhatia from New Delhi. Ruchi, what do these countries want out of India? Hi, uh, hi Lizzie. It's good to be on the show with you. In fact, uh, the, uh, uh, the EFTA nations or Switzerland, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, they want greater market access uh, for their, uh, their products. Uh, one thing is very clear that India is one of the world's most populous nations. It is one of the fastest expanding economies in the world. And rightly so, uh, these uh, these these uh, economies want a piece of uh, the pie as far as the Indian market is concerned. They want easier access for uh, the Swiss chocolates and high-end watches. But as far as India is concerned, uh, this pact is one of a kind because uh, there is a $100 billion investment commitment. And along with that, uh, there, there is a, a, a promise of almost uh, a 1 million jobs being created in the next 15 years. Also, it is coming in and at a time uh, when India is going to go uh, uh, into the election season in the next uh, uh, few uh, weeks or so. So, so coming in at the right time, the pact will give a free uh, will give free access uh, to a labor movement as well. It's as I said, it is one of the kind. It is a modern uh, pact of sorts, which includes a whole host of things, including uh, chapters on labor, uh, environment, as well as gender as well. Uh, it will also provide uh, greater access uh, to uh, the Swiss companies, especially those that are dealing with uh, the pharmaceutical sector, as well as uh, the medical devices industry. So uh, all in all, uh, for India, it uh, it is coming in at uh, the right time when it is negotiating with some of the other countries. And uh, those facts are, in a way, uh, hard to come by. Well, Ruchi, just stick on that, because if, if this initial uh, deal took nearly 16 years to negotiate, when we talk about some of the other deals that are in the works between India, the EU, UK and Australia, I mean, does this mean it's going to be smooth sailing now moving forward? I'm not sure if it's going to be a smooth sailing, but one thing is clear that Prime Minister Narendra Modi is uh, uh, keeping his government in continuum. He is expected uh, to win a third term, and uh, it is expected that the talks on uh, the free trade agreements will continue post-elections as well. Uh, the UK FTA, for example, uh, while the talks have been unresolved uh, at, at the current moment and there is heading into election season, uh, after the elections, one can expect those talks to resume. Also, the big one for India will be uh, the EU uh, FTA as well, uh, where uh, some tough negotiations are underway. India is close to signing a trade uh, pact with uh, Oman as well, and that is going to be uh, coming in at a time when India has already done one with uh, uh, with uh, the UAE. There are talks with the, the GCC nations for a trade pact as well. And India, of course, is bargaining very hard. They are looking to, uh, uh, you know, for, for more access for their goods. But at the same time, India understands that uh, uh, the kind of market access that they will provide for some of the other companies that are looking to diversify away from China uh, will be a big one. So, of course, these negotiations uh, will take uh, some time. Uh, but one thing is clear that uh, once, uh, right. you know, the government walked out of uh, the RCEP agreement, uh, uh, fear brings uh, more uh, right. Chinese products into the market, they are doing more and more FTAs and focusing primarily on that. Right. But Bloomberg's Ruchi Bhatia, really great reporting there. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today on that report.
Uh, let's turn now uh, to the Biden administration. They are said to be weighing sanctions on several Chinese tech companies, including chipmaker Changshin Memory Technologies. Sources say the Commerce Department is considering adding CXMT and five other Chinese firms to its so-called entity list, which restricts companies' access to U.S. technology. CXMT companies with the likes of, or competes, excuse me, with the likes of Micron, Samsung, and also SK Hynix. So joining us now is Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence. So, uh, Robert, is the potential blacklisting of this company likely to have a significant impact on, on China's chip sector? Because we've been talking about this for quite a while. Uh, and how critical it is to, to the economy there. Yeah, I think in the broad uh, spread of things, uh, potentially in the, over the medium to longer term, but probably the short term impact is likely to be fairly minimal because DRAM, which is what this company in question produces, is, is a commodity tech product. So um, there are no restrictions on China's ability to access mainstream DRAM chips. It can still buy them from Samsung and Hynix and Micron and some of the big global suppliers out there. So the near-term impact's likely to be minimal, but you know this is another step by the U.S. administration to sanctioning and putting uh, export restrictions to try and uh, hamper China's efforts to become self-sufficient uh, within technologies. Uh, and obviously, China's core focus at the moment is obviously on um, developing advanced semiconductor processing technology. So. This is the direction of travel, um, and th this news that we're talking about is just a further example of that. And Robert, we've got the NPC, the National People's Congress, wrapping up in less than uh, two hours, 11 o'clock UAE time. What have we heard so far from the Congress on semiconductors? Yeah, I guess the nature of what the NPC is, you never tend to hear, you know, particularly hard or substantive measures. But the country is in, uh, increasing its national R&D budget by 10 percent this year. Um, so that's, uh, you know, an above inflation uh, increase. Um, and also there was separate news uh, that broke on Friday that a separate state run uh, investment fund is looking to increase uh, funding on the semiconductor side by around 27 billion US dollars. Uh, if that news is confirmed, that would amount to a, an approximate 60% increase on the funding from that particular fund, known as imaginatively called the Big Fund. Um, so that, that would amount to a substantial increase in money uh, that the country is trying to throw at this challenge. And I think you know, that's really their only option at the moment, uh, given the technology restrictions that the US and its allies are putting in there. Throwing money at the problem, throwing you know, quality engineers at the problem is, is really their only option at this point. OK, Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you for that. Now, ARK Investments flagship Innovation ETF had not held any NVIDIA shares for about a year. We asked CEO Cathy Wood whether she regrets that decision and what might change her mind about the stock. Take a listen. We wrote it. Uh, most of the way up, but I'll tell you what we did. And this is as a portfolio manager, it's not one action, but the, uh, the what, what it causes in terms of another action. Last year, uh, we sold uh, in the flagship NVIDIA and put it into Coinbase. Mm -hmm. uh, Coinbase, I believe, is up as le at least as much uh, as NVIDIA. And it is much um, less well understood, uh, the whole crypto uh, movement, the crypto asset movement, Bitcoin as a new asset class and so forth, is not well understood or, or completely accepted out there. So we prefer to go where others uh, are, are not traveling as much. And, you know, as we were moving out of uh, NVIDIA, we were saying, OK, regulators are trying to crush uh, Coinbase here. And we were buying it on every dip. NVIDIA hap to, happened to be uh, one of the sources uh, for, for that purchase. So it's not just what we do on the sell side. It is what we do on the buy side that, uh, uh, that you have to look at. Um, and yes, we do hold it in the more specialized funds, but we've been taking profits there as well for reasons I just described.
Yeah, and to be fair, you're right. Coinbase is up about 620% since the end of 2022. So that compares with about 530% gain in NVIDIA. Is there anything though, Kathy, in the NVIDIA story um, that would make you rethink the name and want to become more aggressive on it? Yeah, if the price came down a lot, uh, we would. You know, the, the rate of return expectations or a we split? have. Would a split do it? Because I know we, we've been. No, kind of a, no, 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 no okay. that wouldn't change. That yeah. wouldn't change anything. No, the, the, the no split adjusted then then the price. Um, so, you know, if you look at uh, our portfolios, what we're trying to capitalize on with a Palantir, for example, uh, are the next stages of this AI revolution. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing in the GPU side of things is NVIDIA, all praise to Jensen One. I mean, just unbelievable uh, company execution, vision, and so forth. And, and it's not over. It's going to last a long time. But there are, there are going to be many other companies benefiting from AI. The productivity lift alone is going to be massive, the most massive productivity lift uh, in history, we believe. And so this AI revolution is going to be broad-based and is going to benefit a lot of companies. In the On the GPU side, of course, we have AMD as competition, but many people do not understand that there's a lot of other surreptitious competition evolving out there. Uh, each of the hyperscalers uh, mm -hmm. is evolving its own chip strategy. You have a Tesla that uh, has designed its own chip for an AI chip for the specialized, more specialized autonomous driving opportunity. And I think you're gonna see a lot of companies developing more specialized chips. Um, we know that uh, NVIDIA, of course, will segment the market as well. So mm. um, we just think that a, a lot of the assumptions for NVIDIA, you know, that this is NVIDIA's market and it's right. alone, that those are changing. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg. Let's stick in the region and get the latest from Nigeria and its mounting cost of living crisis. The price of some vital food staples have doubled in a matter of months in the West African nation, with trucks hauling items like rice and pasta being hijacked along rural highways. For more on this, we are joined by Bloomberg's Andira Oganga, who has been following this story from Kigali for us. So, Andira, just walk us through uh, the latest in terms terms of the unrest, uh, because this is pretty significant when we talk about the cost of living and the pressure that everyday Nigerians are under. Jen, we're seeing a wave of desperation sweep across Nigeria due to the aggressive reforms that were introduced by President Bola Ahmed Tinibu. When he was sworn into power, his first order of business was to scrap off fuel subsidy. And though they were really costly to the government, they offered a huge relief to ordinary Nigerians. The trickle-down effect is pump prices doubled, transport costs tripled, and this is affecting the cost of basic goods and services. We've also seen the liberalization of the FX market, and the Naira has plunged 70 percent to the dollar. Coupled with insecurity that was flagged by the Central Bank of Nigeria, the cost of food has risen astronomically. And this in an economy where an average household spends at least 50 percent of their income on food, the World Food Program is warning that 26 million people face food insecurity this year. Andira, I just want to get your take on Ethiopia. Why is it reconsidering the recognition of Somaliland as a sovereign state? Lizzie, we are seeing mounting political and diplomatic tension um, on Ethiopia, and they're beginning to fold on their position. When Ethiopia's Premier Abiy Ahmed was in Arabi to meet President William Ruto, he mentioned that he is willing to step back from the most controversial deal of the element, um, or rather the most controversial elements of the deal that they have with um, Somaliland. And uh, this is something that President William Ruto also brought to his Somali counterpart, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, who was in Arabi at the same time. However, Somaliland is not reading from the same script. Their ambassador at large says that they're firmly committed to their deal with Ethiopia, but this is incumbent on Ethiopia recognizing Somaliland as a sovereign state. 
OK, Bloomberg's on Dira Oganga in Kigali. We thank you for that update out of Africa. Now, let's get you up to speed on some of the other stories Bloomberg is watching on the terminal today. Egyptian inflation unexpectedly accelerated last month, with consumer prices in urban areas rising 35.7% in the year to February. That was up from a reading just below 30% in January, with the pound's recent devaluation set to further increase import costs. Month on month, prices were up more than 11%. The fastest pace in records stretching back to 2007. In Europe, Portugal's centre-right AD coalition has won elections held this weekend in a tight race which also saw support for the far-right surge. With almost all votes counted, the AD secured 79 seats, two more than the socialists. Far-right party Chega, which was only founded in 2019, recorded the biggest jump, quadrupling its representation. We've got plenty more still ahead, so stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East and Africa. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in Johannesburg. The U.S. Justice Department has opened a criminal investigation into the January mid-air blowout of a Boeing 737 MAX fuselage panel on an Alaska Airlines flight. The airline says this is standard practice for the G DOJ and that it doesn't believe it's the target of the inquiry. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Danny Lee, who's been following the story. So, Danny, Boeing doesn't have records for what appears to have been a faulty repair shortly before uh, this jet was delivered last year. Uh, I mean, uh, how unusual is this? It seems like the bad news keeps piling on for Boeing right now. Yeah, and for Boeing, it says it doesn't have any records or documentation for the work that was done on this door panel. And so it just adds to you no know, further criticism potentially at Boeing for its record keeping, record keeping, which is important in something like the aviation industry. And of course, this door panel, which eventually blew out midair on this Alaska Airlines flight in mid-January, it's the incident that has heaped a whole string of uh, criticism uh, and fallout for Boeing, which it is now currently trying to manage. Uh, and so Boeing's response, in fact, was in relation to uh, Senate, U.S. Senate committee hearing last week where the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board Chair Jennifer Homendy criticised and lambasted Boeing for its lack of cooperation into its ongoing investigation into trying to find out what has happened. And of course, uh, this is something where this door panel is supposed to be held by four bolts. And it suggests that these four bolts were not in place on this aircraft uh, when it was uh, suffered this mid-air blowout. So this is obviously a PR nightmare for Boeing. How is it trying to shore up its commitment on safety, Danny? Yeah, that's right. And so one of the things that we've heard from Boeing in the recent days is that it is now going to try and link uh, more of safety and quality to uh, bonus payouts. And this will affect more than 100,000 uh, non-union Boeing employees going forward. And so therefore the onus is on uh, workers to ensure that everything it produces from the Boeing factory is safe and is up to the highest standard possible. And one other thing that we did see over the, the, the recent uh, days as well is that Boeing's largest union, the machinists which make these aircraft, they're looking for their first full contract in 16 years and they're looking for a pay rise of up to 40% over three years. So uh, clearly uh, Boeing's negotiations with uh, workers in particular over things like safety and quality will continue for many weeks and months to come. OK, and we will keep across that. Bloomberg's Danny Lee, we thank you for that update on Boeing. And as we look at the markets, you've got US equity futures pointing to a lower opening. S&P evenies are lower a tenth of a percent. Eurostox 50 futures are also lower a six tenths of a percent currently. You've got US Treasury yields on the 10-year lower a basis point at 4.06 percent as we await that US CPI print tomorrow. We also get at 7 a.m. UK time the UK jobs report. That, of course, will feed into the BOE. Bank of England's decision making on when it's going to cut rates. You've got Brent currently uh, trading at $81 a barrel and Bitcoin not quite at that 70k level it was at on Friday. Stay with us for more. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 